When we meditate, we're working on a skill, how to bring the mind into the present moment in a way that's alert and still at the same time. So you come to the breath, because that's your anchor in the present moment. You figure out how to keep the mind interested in the breath. This is one of the reasons that John Lee teaches that you work with the breath energies. Notice how you feel the breath in the chest, how you feel the breath in the abdomen, how you feel it in your shoulders, your arms, your legs. Breath here being the energy that allows the air to come in and out of the lungs more than the air itself. This energy flow can be anywhere. And as you get more acquainted with it, you begin to realize that it has a lot of benefits for the body. If you have any chronic illnesses, that can be a that can be your beachhead in getting familiar with the breath. In other words, you see that if you've got some chronic pain in your foot or your leg, think of the breath energy going down the back, out the leg, out through the foot, out to the toes, and out through the toes. It improves the, ins the circulation there, and the general energy flow gets improved, and things can actually get better. Now you experiment, and you find that in some cases working with the breath doesn't have much of an impact on some problems in the body, but you'll be surprised how many it does have an impact on. It's one way you can get interested in the flow of the breath and then wanting to stay with the breath. And then just the realization that the present moment is where you are creating suffering for yourself, and you don't have to. And if you want to see it, how you're doing it, so that you can put an end to it, you've got to stay right here. So that gives you some motivation to stay here. And as with any skill, as we're working on this, we find that sometimes there's too much effort, sometimes there's not enough. Sometimes things are discovered by indirection. In other words, you see something out of the corner of your eye that you didn't expect. But you do that by having a regular regimen that you follow. And it's when you stick with that regular regimen, you begin to see minor variations and little subtle things that you would have missed otherwise. It's like a bus driver who has the same route day after day after day. As he gets used to the basic features of the ride, he'll begin to notice slight changes here and there in the road, on the sidewalk, in the buildings he drives past. If he didn't go every day, he wouldn't notice the slight changes. This is why we keep coming back to our basic meditation topic, because as we keep coming back, coming back, there will come times when we see more clearly what we're doing as we come back, and we also see more clearly what we're doing as we wander off and then come back again. And in some cases, problems can be solved by approaching things systematically, and other times they can be solved only if you've tried everything that you can think of and nothing works, then you just stop and watch for a bit. allow things to run on their own for a while, but you're not giving up, you're just being strategic. Obviously there's something that you're missing, and perhaps the way you frame the issue to yourself is wrong, so you want to put that frame down and just watch for a bit, be open to different possibilities. When you catch something new, okay, try that out. Pick that up as your approach. But what it comes down to, as with any other, any skill, it's not only the indirection and the balance, but sometimes it's just putting in the effort. You put in time and you observe. And you apply other qualities as well. There's a tendency in the forest tradition to take some of the Buddha's basic teachings and see how they can be applied to the practice of meditation. And one of them is series of teachings the Buddha gave on how to work for your own benefit in this lifetime. It's pretty basic stuff. It's one, being industrious and being taking initiative 
in your work. Two, when you've done your proper work and you've gotten the results from that, you are vigilant in looking after what you've got. You don't throw things away. You're not careless about them. Three, you hang around with the right people, people who won't lead you astray. And four, that you conduct your life in a way that's appropriate for your income. In other words, you're not too stingy and you're not too extravagant. You're not too miserly, because you don't waste what you've got. You try to find just the right balance between working, denying yourself the pleasures you want, and then uh, supplying yourself with some of those pleasures. Those are basic good instructions for how to lead your life. Take initiative in your work. Look after what you've got. Take good care of what you've got. Be careful who you hang out with, and you live your life in a balanced way. Well, these same principles apply to the meditation. You've got to take initiative. You're sitting here and your mind is not settling down. You have to ask yourself, well, what's wrong? And try things out. Where are you focused in the body? Is your focus the right place for you to be focused right now? There are lots of places you can be focused on the body. It can be the tip of the nose, the middle of the forehead, in your palate, in the middle of the head, in your throat, your chest, your abdomen. If you find that focusing up in the head puts a lot of pressure up there, well, move your focus down. If you're focused down in the body and you find that you're getting sleepy, you can move your focus back up. Then look at the breath. How are you breathing? Is this the best way you could be breathing right now? Sometimes the body seems to have a way of knowing how to breathe, and sometimes it's totally clueless. In other words, the body left to its own devices can sometimes get into some really weird breath, breath rhythms. So sometimes you listen to the body and what, it's, what it wants, seems to want to do, and other times you have to push things in another direction. I would find myself back in the days when I had migraines, and occasionally I'd get into a cycle where the way I was breathing was actually aggravating the migraine. And I had to very consciously breathe in a way that was not all that pleasant. I had to fill up the abdomen as much as possible, expand the abdomen in all directions as much as possible long breathing for quite a while. And even though it wasn't pleasant, it would get me out of the unhealthy breath cycle and help with the migraine. So sometimes you have to push things in another direction against what the body seems to be wanting to do. But again, you learn this by trial and error. So you have to take your initiative in trying to figure things out. And read the instructions in the book, give them a try, and if they don't work, you ask yourself, okay, where do I make adjustments? Once you've got something good, you don't throw it away. This means that when you're sitting here and the mind finally settles down, do your best to maintain that sense of ease, that sense of stability. That's a part of the mind that says, well, I've gotten enough now, now I can move on to something else. Well, enough is not enough. You want to stay here. You're not here just to give yourself a little hit of pleasure. You're here because you want to see the present moment continuously, because things are going to come up here. The stress and suffering that weighs down the mind is what comes from your present actions. So you want to see them in the act. Then you want to have your gaze steady so that unexpected things will appear. That's being vigilant in the course of your meditation. When you leave meditation, try not to leave. In other words, you get up from here, that doesn't mean that you have to spill your concentration all over the floor. You try to carry it with you in the same way that you would carry a bowl that was full of oil or full of water. Try not to let it drip. Try to maintain a sense of balance and poise as you get up and walk around. 
and that will keep you connected with the breath. And as you're connected with the breath, sometimes interesting things will come up as you're getting up and leaving the meditation, walking away. So again, don't throw away the possibility of seeing something unexpected during these unexpected times. It's so easy to have that attitude, well, the, time, the meditate is up, and I'll go back and I'll meditate a little bit more before I go to bed tonight. Well, in the meantime, you've dropped things. So try not to drop things. Look after them. Maintain them. As for admirable friends, this of course refers to the different voices in your mind. The voices that are on the side of greed, aversion, and delusion don't advertise themselves as greed, aversion, delusions, henchmen, but they are. You have to learn how to recognize them. John Sawat used to say our problem is that we see pain as our enemy and our cravings as our friends, and we have to realize it's the other way around. If you can learn how to get intimate with pain, you're going to be able to understand it. And as for your cravings, you have to learn how to put a question mark against what they say. So be very careful who you hang out with inside. Finally, with the principle of a balanced livelihood, okay, we're meditating here both for clarity and for ease. And there are times when the mind really needs just to plug into a really comfortable breath and stay there without having to think much of anything else, because it needs the rest. It needs to gain its energies. But there will come a point where you can pull out of your concentration a little bit. Don't pull all the way out. Pull out a little bit and ask yourself, okay, what's going on in the mind? What am I latching onto here? What am I doing here right now that's causing some unnecessary stress? In other words, ask yourself questions, again, about the process of what the mind is doing right now. And when you learn how to balance these two things, the drive for pleasure and the questioning, that's how the meditation can maintain itself here. Concentration leads to discernment. Your discernment leads to more concentration. They work together. Just be careful when you're going, for, though, for the sense of pleasure that you don't abandon the breath. This is something that's all too easy, and especially when there are people out there telling you that that's what you've got to do. I was talking to someone this morning who was saying, I've been listening to a teacher who said, if you want to get into deeper jhana, you abandon the breath and just go jumping into pleasure. Well, the pleasure comes from being with the breath. And if you abandon the cause, everything begins to blur out. You stay with the breath, I'll just allow it to get more subtle, even when the breath is still. There's still a breath energy in the body. It's, it's kind of like a buzz in your nerves. And that can be enough to keep you grounded so you don't go drifting away. So even as you Realize, okay, this is a time when you really need to just settle in and be quiet. You've got to be vigilant. You've got to look after what you've got. Protect it. At the same time when you're asking questions in the mind, don't go too far away from your concentration. Because as the analysis starts heading out away from the present moment, you're just going off into perceptions. Remember, the questions are always related to, what are you doing here right now? This is true for all meditation methods. When you're analyzing the body parts, okay, the question is, okay, what are the perceptions you're doing right now? What are they doing to the mind? The perceptions that you're using in your analysis. You want to learn how to see okay, what kind of perceptions are there for the sake of saying, I want this to be beautiful, and the ones that say, I want this to be unappealing. What's the choice? Who's making the choice? What's going on in there? You want to look back into the mind. The same with the breath. You want to look at what the Buddha calls fabrication going on in the mind. That's where the insight comes. But it's right here as you're doing the concentration. So to maintain this balance between going for the pleasure and going for the insight, remember they can't be two radically separated things. They have to come together if they're really going to have good results. This is one of the ways you take that 
very basic teaching. And the Buddha basically telling people how to find some success in life, get some wealth, and have some benefit from it. And you can apply it to the wealth of your concentration, the wealth of your meditation. Have initiative. Be vigilant in protecting the good things you've got. Be very careful about who you hang out with, and try to find the right balance between your desire for pleasure and your desire for knowledge. This is where your concentration will develop in a way that you benefit right here, right now, in this present life. And will have a good impact on into the future.